But hold your questions, as I said. All right. I'm Donovan Bigelow. This is the first of four lectures on the development of psychology from Freud through Melanie Klein. It's based on the material by Robert Kafer, his book entitled Immaterial Facts, Freud's Discovery of the Unconscious, and Klein's Development of His Work. Really important introduction. It sets out themes that come back all throughout the quarter. First, on page one of the lecture notes, if you don't have the lecture notes, see me and get them later. All of the basic concepts are reviewed in this book. This is one of the most thorough, sort of all-encompassing reviews of psychology I've ever read. That's why I'm sharing it with you. The first, maybe the most important, the shift from biology to psychology. Up until Klein, and up until at least halfway through, two-thirds, in fact, of the way through Freud's career, he was a biologist of the mind. He really thought that the human mind worked in the same way a hydraulic machine worked, that the physiology of the body worked. Why should the mind work any differently? It, it took a long time to listen to patients carefully enough and get enough clinical data amassed to very dramatically shift out of a biologist's perspective, out of a mechanic's perspective, to the one that privileged emotion and meaning and unconscious dynamics. That's probably the biggest change in psychology in the last hundred years and some specific issues underneath that which we'll struggle with for the rest of the quarter, which I, I suspect, though you may not know exactly why or what you're struggling with, the very meaning of anxiety. Is anxiety caused by repression? Is repression caused by anxiety? There were so many of these dynamics that Freud saw operating in the mind of his clients, and he just didn't understand them initially. He didn't understand them at all. He, in fact, he got them backwards several times and had to reevaluate after decades of experience. What is anxiety? I mean, physiologically, it makes some sense. You get hot, you get sweaty, you get nervous, your pupils dilate, focus in, you have a feeling state, but what is it in the mind? How do we describe what's going on? What's evoked in us exactly? And where does aggression come from? Is it innate? Is it biological, genetic, evolutionary? How is it processed? How is it resisted? Where does aggression come from and how does it both assist us to get done what we need to get done on a daily basis, and how, if it's not processed appropriately, if it's not balanced with other issues, if it's not balanced by a strong enough ego, for example, it can get us in a great deal of trouble. But what is it exactly? How did Freud come to think about the human mind as rent with conflicts? Up until Freud, it was mostly assumed that the human mind was a unitary thing, that who you were was who you were. But it, it occurred to Freud, because he listened to his patients very carefully, that the human mind is, is riven with conflicts and splits and parts pulling and hauling against each other. One of the sources of anxiety, he came to think. Okay? So how is it that we become in such conflict with ourselves so much? Not to mention the external world. The part that Hannah Siegel mentions, and Hannah Siegel was one of Melanie Klein's analysands. That means she was analyzed by Klein herself and ended up doing a great deal of writing along with several others in the post-Kleinian movement um, that remains to this day profoundly influential. But the thing that she notices initially is that Klein's great innovation was the ability to take Freud's work with adults and translate it to children. That what she saw in children's minds was effectively the same thing that Freud saw in adult minds. Complexity, conflict, anxieties, fears, hate, love, devotion, in tremendous measures. She saw a complexity in the minds of very young children that no one had thought about before, no one had been able to see before. And she explored that at length for decades, and we'll get to that later on. The quote at the bottom of page one of the notes, the slow privileging of psychic reality and the relationship with the external factor. Okay, first day of class I talked about the inevitable integration between genetics and biology and the environment. Nature versus nurture. For decades and decades people asked, well, did he do that because of biology and genetics? Is he an alcoholic because he's got the alcoholic gene? Which doesn't exist, by the way. 
Or did he do it because his mother dropped him on his head too many times? And the answer is, of course, I think, an integration. We no longer as a field. Psychology, I think, across the board, in all the different domains, is now, I can safely say, beyond those old splits, beyond those old dichotomies. No one in the field now answers the question, no one who's competent, answers the question, why did he or she do this thing, by citing either genetics or environment in any pure way. It's always a mix of both. And that is one of the things that Klein ultimately highlighted, which Freud laid the foundation for, that we are this amazing integration between psychic rea of psychic reality. Now, that's a very careful term of art, which is going to end up on your test, I'm sure. Psychic reality. It is a combination, an integration, of all of your biological, genetic drives, instincts, however you want to label them, and the perceptions, your experiences in the world, your nurturing environment in childhood, your identifications, your introjections, all of these different words for basically the accumulated sum total of your experience as a child and young adult. That makes you who you are. That's your identity. This combination of genetics, and the perception and experience that you have combined in this mix of psychic reality. Okay. Let's go back. Uh, well, first, a uh, cautionary note. On the, in the first chapter, Immaterial Facts, Dr. Paper relates some material by a thinker named Bion, along with Siegel, one of Klein's first, uh, well, major, not first, but major analysis, who subsequently is maybe now the most influential person beyond Anna Freud and Melanie Klein, probably beyond is, is right there next. His writings have become quite uh, impactful all over the world. And he throws out, Dr. Caper uses Beyond's example as a cautionary tale. Because almost every one of you, almost every one of you, thinks of the human mind as some sort of machine, like a computer. Language in, language out. Garbage in, garbage out. What did I learn today? I see it, I learn it, I do it. Okay, very simplistic, dynamic model of human mental functioning, which is exactly what Freud started with, but isn't what we have anymore. And I'm going to challenge you all the way along to, to realize that the way you have traditionally thought about human mental functioning no longer is very helpful, and in fact, may be at the very core of many of your problems on a day-to-day -day basis. If you don't understand how the mind really works, it's really hard to change. You can't fix a car engine unless you know what all the pieces and parts do. Same thing with the human mind, but the additional step is critical. The human mind is not like a car engine. You can't take it apart and put it back together with new pieces and parts because there's something about being human, there's something about the mind that's greater than the sum of all the parts the essence of your identity. And you all feel this. I know you all feel this. There is no way you feel like an assemblage of pieces and parts. That you are merely the accumulation of your experiences thrown together with your genetics. There's no way you think that way. You feel like there's something special about you that makes you different from everybody else. And although your, uh, your identity abides over time, that you, the sense of yourself is consistent over time, there is a sense of yourself as something more than just an accumulation of experiences and genetics. That's what I think ultimately, where psychology ultimately has gone to try to understand what exactly that is. How to think about the mind. And, the, and Beyond emphasizes the danger, of the continuing danger, of thinking about the mind using purely mechanical models. We've got to get away from that. We can't do that. We're in some serious trouble. But let's start with that, because that's where Freud starts. And th that you still think that way, in many ways, is a direct derivative of Freud's thinking 100 years ago. It became sort of the cultural norm. It's just now changing decades and decades and decades after Freud's death. And, but the residual cultural uh, lessons, which slowly have permeated society, have now become so common that most of you think that way. Did you know you're all Freudians? You're all Freudians. You didn't even know it. Most of you, many of you, have never heard the name Freud. Certainly not anything that Freud had written before. But it turns out if you're human in a Western culture, and if you're human in almost any culture now, 
His influence is pervasive. And so let's start with it. Freud's early model of the mind, I'm on page two of the notes. He really thought, consistent with his training as a neurologist, that the human mind simply functioned in the same way any other bodily organ functioned. A, a mechanical network of neurons in which electrical charges were stored and transmitted. He thought that the mind was just the sum total, mechanically, of all of these electrical discharges of neurons. The neuron had just been discovered. It was very exciting for them. If there was mental illness, it, meant it had some sort of electrical problem. Your circuits weren't working right. Some charge was being built up, and it was over-excited or over-hot, for example. You could burn out a fuse. And that's how he thought about it. So his treatment therapies initially were designed to figure out how to, to get at that electrical discharge, to get at whatever it was that is causing those electrical discharges, those neuronal discharges, to build up to the point where it was interfering with the rest of your functioning. And what did he come to the conclusion to? In most of his female patients, he came to the conclusion, well, let's see, what would cause that kind of thing? Well, it must be childhood abuse. And given that most of his patients seemed to have some sort of sexual dysfunction, he surmised that it must have been some kind of sexual abuse. Therefore, sexual abuse causes mental illness. Therefore, if he can get back at what really happened and get, those cathar get that cathartically released, let that get back to the memory of it, if he could, he would then allow that energy to be discharged and the symptoms of mental illness would go away almost magically. Cool theory. How did it work out for him? It didn't, it started, he thought he had, was having great success. It turned out that the truth was he was very prestigious. It was an honor to be seen by Freud. And if he was telling you you were getting better, you got better. It tended to be a little placebo effect. If Freud was treating you, well, why you must be getting better because he's so famous and he knows so much. And it appeared that even Freud got caught up in that a little bit. And the truth was he ultimately had to admit that his method wasn't working very well. Then he looked back at his case notes and he kept listening to his patients and he ultimately had to admit that this way of thinking about the mind wasn't really working very well. Now, that left him with a problem, because he dedicated most of 20 years to this model of his mind, and the whole thing looks like it's about ready to fall apart, page three. He called it a disaster, initially. I mean, imagine working for 20 years in a field, and you discover something new that says virtually everything you've done for 20 years is now useless. <laughs> what did he do when, that, when he faced that? He took a deep breath and went, okay, what have I learned? And what he learned was that it's not the memory that's the problem, but the subjective experience, and that that subjective experience was never just based on the memory. That it was always in part, it always in part included the patient's own fantasy, psychic reality, kept intruding into his work. And he finally took a good look and saw it happening, recognized it for what it was, and realized that his patients' minds were dramatically more complicated than he had thought they were under this old, simple, mechanical model. He realized that it isn't the thing, it's the meaning of the thing. How many times have I said that already? I'll say it more often. That when a patient is exhibiting certain symptoms of mental illness, we have to recognize that it isn't just a straight line, linear derivative of some childhood experience. That they're actually participating that the symptoms have meaning to this person. I've never met two patients with the same mental illness. I've met two patients that are both depressed. I've met two patients that are both schizoid. I've met patients that are both that are psychotic. But they're never that way in the same way. It's always a mix. You've met people who have the flu. It's pretty much the same flu most of the time. You do pretty much the same stuff. Not true in mental illness. Freud sort of saw in the diversity of his clients an indication that what he was dealing with was not a simple mechanical model. And so he shifted. He realized he was dealing with something much more than that, much more complicated than that. And that's where the idea of psychic reality came from. This mixture of perception and emotion-laden fantasy, and more important than external reality in terms of neurosis. You don't have to be abused, neglected, mistreated as a child to be mentally ill. Not at all. Okay. 
and he references a man named Charcot, who was a French neurologist in Paris, who he went to train with in his early days as a medical student. And, he, and Charcot was an interesting character, a bit of a flamboyant, you might even call him a narcissist today. He was, he was pretty proud of his showmanship, and he would have dozens and dozens, hundreds of, of would-be doctors, doctors in training, even experienced doctors, would come to him, and he would treat these neurotic patients right in front of them all, which is interesting. Um, and he had pictures of them, and he would, the one thing he did that made sense to Freud, and the one part of his method that remains today absolutely valid, is that he listened. He listened very carefully to his patients. He came to the wrong conclusions quite a bit, but he always said that it wasn't theory that should help us diagnose our patients. It's what the patients tell us, and we should listen without being blinded by our own prejudices. Now, what Freud discovered, what this is a lot easier said than done, that if you think a certain way, if your mind is a, is a function of your experience and genetics and your accumulated experience, all in this amalgam of psychic reality, then how do you change? You don't change very easily, and you don't change very quickly, and you don't change very well most of the time. It's painful to change. It's difficult to change. None of this surprises anybody in this room, I hope, because you all know it's true. But this explains, in a, in a way, why. And it also opens up the possibility of meaningful change. One of the things that Freud has been accused of, and I think rightly, is that he was a determinist. Meaning, he didn't think, he ultimately became a bit, not, I don't want to say cynical, but he was not uh, optimistic about how effective psychoanalysis was going to be. Because he understood how complicated, how deep the human mind was, how we resist change, how powerfully we are often in denial, even in the face of death and destruction. The old saying, people fear change more than death, I think is true. Have you talked to an alcoholic lately about quitting the bottle? Do you think they don't know they're killing themselves? That they don't know they're destroying their lives and all of the people around them half the time? They need to take a class on the impact of alcoholism on a family or on themselves? They know exactly what they're doing. They don't have the slightest doubt what they're doing. And yet they seem to persist beyond all reason. And Freud said, correct, it's unconscious. And until and unless we can get at that psychic reality, there is no simple change on the surface. Charcot helped him take a look at his patient's reality. And he said something that I just thought was wonderful. He said, theory is great, but it doesn't stop things from existing. When someone would say, well, that can't happen because the theory says this. And Charcot would just sort of chuckle and say, OK, that's great. Your theory is wonderful, but theory doesn't stop things from existing. How many of you, in your political lives, in your family life, do not see that which you don't agree with or dismiss it immediately? If you don't agree with it, your first reaction is to judge it as wrong, immoral, bad. It makes you uncomfortable to be around someone who doesn't agree with you on anything. But Freud said that's a motivated, motivated issue. Nobody is around those who are different. What's racism about? The uncomfortableness with difference, and many other things, of course. But that's at the bedrock of our inability to change. How hard is it to change a racist's attitude? About as hard as it is to change an alcoholic's attitude toward the bottle. I think this material opens up the possibility of change in a way the mechanical model of the mind never could. It gives hope. Are we determined? This is the key point. Freud was, was a determinist. He was, un, he was not optimistic about what psychoanalysis could do. And yet, I think he held out the possibility that this way of thinking about the human mind opens up the only real possibility for freedom. Come on, folks. Everybody's talking about freedom. I've I got to be free. All the politicians are talking about liberty, as if, as if that could be just handed to you, OK? This might be a way of thinking about your life that will open up possibilities for the only meaningful freedom you'll ever have. Because unless you can stop just doing what you've been trained to do, unless you can stop and recognize that it isn't just the way things are. Your reactions, your values, your experience, your understanding of the world and yourselves 
is determined by these things. That's true. And to be able to understand that, and to be able to understand specifically how that has happened, opens up the possibility of change the way nothing else can. That's Freud's sort of very reluctant optimism. Okay. I've already talked about Klein. Now, again, the big innovation for Klein, top of page four of the notes, Klein and the unexpectedly complex nature of the baby's mind. I think she took Freud's lessons seriously. And she looked at, how many of you have looked at children? I mean, really, paid attention to them. What you find, if you're honest, is a lot more complexity than we were told. They aren't just little bundles of joy. Now, very often they are. But they're also little bundles of anger and rage and fear and anxiety. You see it in, in small children. When small children get angry, oh my god, they're angry. I hate you, kicking the shins. And when they say I hate you, is there any doubt that they mean it to the ends of their toes? Oh, right in that moment, they hate. They hate purely. And they get over it rather quickly. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't take it seriously and understand their experience of it. Klein did that more than anybody else ever had up to that point. OK. So a, little, a few of them, real quick, I want to get through the nuts and bolts of chapter two, the psychology without a psyche. Freud's project for a scientific psychology. He wanted so badly to be a scientist in the old school way. He wanted to be respected by the scientists of his day. And he tried very hard to come up with this idea of the mind as mechanical, as a function of electrical discharges. It simply didn't work. And one of his first big breakthroughs was in 1905 when he published the uh, three essays on sexuality. And in it, he laid out for the first time this question of childhood sexuality. That his understanding that children's minds Though he didn't quite understand the complexity of them the way Klein ultimately did, he got something that nobody else had got, and that our children have a lot more going on in their minds than we thought, but here's the kicker, a lot more sexually than we thought. They have fantasies, they have ideas, they have thoughts about where they came from and what mommy and daddy are doing behind closed doors, and what is that noise, and what does that mean, and what do I have, and what do I don't have, all right? So it shocked people. It horrified people. It still does to this day. I have students all the time in class read the little Hans case that you hopefully have read and just feel disgusted by it. It's grotesque. And my question is, who taught you that it's grotesque? Who taught you that children don't have these feelings, these ideas, these fantasies? Because they do, and they always have. There's some prejudice in our culture that says these things are bad and we shouldn't think about them, and we absolutely shouldn't think about children having them. But it turns out they do. And if we pretend they don't, we do our children a grave disservice. Now, Freud was, was when I am one, that believes that children need very firm boundaries. I am not an advocate of, oh, let them do whatever they want. Oh, no, no. The sexuality, the aggression has to be contained. Children need boundaries, and they need firm boundaries in order to develop health in a healthy way. That's obvious. But at the time Freud came up with these ideas about the complexity and sexual dynamics, and by sexual dynamics he did not mean a direct fantasy of adult style sexuality in children. That's not what he said, which most modern readers of Freud misunderstand. He, he used the word libido, and to him that meant life energy. It was a libido theory. All right, of development that said this life energy. When he meant sexuality, he meant life in a much more broad way. Okay, So he, when he said child sexuality, he didn't think about children having sex. That's not what he meant at all. And if you get over that little misunderstanding, then the rest of it makes a lot more sense. What he meant was children have an innate <clears throat> sense of awareness of their bodily reactions. When you see a child a baby at the breast after a good feed. You see the look on its face, and it's in heaven. I mean, you, you could say it's almost orgasmic. The joy, the feeling state is much more than just, hey, good, I, I'm full now, and I, I don't need to eat anymore. It, it's a much more embodied experience. Same thing with the other intense emotions. Tremendous 
anger, tremendous primitive emotional dynamics involved, and, f and we've all seen that, we're less comfortable with the erotic element of children's experience. Freud was open to it, he tried to think about it and see what he was seeing, although he himself never treated patients. If you notice the little Hans case, Freud was talking to little Hans's father, who was relaying the events and then going back and using Freud's guidance to help his son. So Freud didn't have much experience with, with children directly himself. This material was so shocking, uh, the section called A Scientific Fairy Tale. The most uh, important doctor of the age in Vienna in 1905, the most important doctor who did anything close to psychology at the time, was the magisterial Kraft Ebbing. He was classic. He was arrogant. He was German. He knew everything there was to know about sexuality. And he listened in the audience with most of the European leaders on, this, on the issue. And Freud presented his three essays on sexuality in 1905. And sitting in the front row, apparently, Kraft Ebing turns to his colleagues and in a voice loud enough for everyone to hear says, it seems like a scientific fairy tale to me, and got up and walked out. And when he did that, Freud was humiliated, was ostracized, and he had very little collegial uh, engagement for per the better part of 10 years until his writings became so powerful that nobody could ignore him anymore. He called it my splendid isolation. I think he was being optimistic. I think it was painful for him rather dramatically to be rejected by everyone. Okay, so question. If you come up with an idea, whatever it is, and everybody you know says it's crazy, how likely are you to stick with it? Most of you would bail on your ideas. Freud didn't bail on his patients. And that's what he thought he would have had to do. He was being honest with his patients like nobody else was. He was respected. Freud was probably the only doctor in Europe who actually respected his female patients. Modern feminists have called Freud a bit of a misogynist, he, like he was prejudiced, like he, he was too male-oriented. He probably was overall. But compared to everybody else in his culture at the time, he was a radical feminist, which we don't think about nowadays very much, or not nearly enough. So the lesson that Freud took away was be trust your patient's autonomy. Respect your patients. Listen to what they're telling you. Try to understand if they're if what they bring to you doesn't fit your theories, change your theories. And amass as much information clinically as you can. Okay, so chapter three, the discovery of unconscious fantasy. His first model of the mind, <coughs> topographic. We've all read this already, I hope. The idea that there's a conscious, a pre-conscious, and an unconscious. That's all Freud had to begin with. It wasn't enough. He adds this economic and dynamic element that we all have only so much energy. And you all know it's true. I mean, come on. At the end of the day, you choose to do four or five things, and that's all you've got. You've got nothing left. You run out of energy. Freud understood it in more sort of dynamic Newtonian terms, but it, he put his finger on something that seemed kind of obvious. He added this dynamic element because he thought at some level, if you push down here, you pushed up there. It was like pistons. You push this one down, this one comes up. So it wasn't just expending energy in one direction. They were connected somehow in the mind. And he struggled with trying to understand it. His genetic theory of development, the oral sta the stage theory, oral, anal, phallic, latent, adolescent, and adult, ultimately. Now, everybody today disagrees with the way Freud sliced and diced childhood development. But the one thing that's very, very clear, nobody disagrees with the fact of development. You can, uh, Dr. Huffman in her text, and every other development book I've ever looked at, I've looked at dozens and dozens, all have children's development in very discrete stages. The stages vary from thinker to thinker, but we are all in agreement that Freud was right about his genetic model of child development. And there's a little confusion about the language. To him, genetic meant developmental not genetics and chromosomes and that sort of thing. Uh, sorry for the confusion, it's just the field. Okay? Under this, in his libido theory, he thought there were two primary drives, sexuality and aggression. He thought first it was just sex. For most of his career, until he was 70 years old, he stuck to the idea that we are creatures 
primarily dominated by sexuality. Why? Because that's what he thought, saw his patients doing, and he stuck to what his patients did. But it wasn't until he was 70 years old. Can you imagine this? You're 70 years old. You've been working since you were a teenager in this field, and you realize that you've left something out. The dual instinct theory. He realized that he had not given sufficient attention to aggression. And he said, we must change all of psychoanalysis in light of the discovery of the importance of aggression. Again, I thought, how many of us who spent our whole lives doing something would be open to the possibility that we screwed it up real bad, left out something really, really important, and had to, at age 70, try something completely new and different? How many of your grandparents, if you knew them, and if they ever made it to 70, were open to something radically different? <laughs> I'm still waiting for somebody to say yes to that question. I've not heard it. Maybe, maybe now and then, but darn rarely. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's get back to this. We'll come to the structural theory a little bit later. All right. Freud gives four reasons. I'm on page six of the notes for giving up his old mechanical theory. It didn't work. Was the first one. Lack of therapeutic success. And despite his initial sort of hope and probably arm twisting a little. There were no actual vivid memories of molestation. He did No woman came to him after working with him for three or four or five or six months and said, oh yes, now I remember. That's what happened when I was little. It never happened. And so the other scary thought was, if this theory was true and every neurotic woman had a father or uncle or brother who was a child molester, turns out the vast majority of Austrian men would have been child molesters. This wasn't likely. Now, I want to be really clear here. He never said, not once, ever, that child molestation, sexual abuse, would not directly cause mental illness. He was very clear that it would, quite likely. In fact, does. He never hesitated. He never doubted that for a minute. And anyone that says that that's the case, that somehow Freud abandoned women, or somehow Freud didn't take into account sexual abuse, simply hasn't read Freud accurately. I've read him. He says it as clear as a, a bell. That kind of sexual and or physical trauma will cause directly significant mental illness in a large percentage of, of sexual abuse victims. No question about it. And nothing in the literature today says anything different. It, it, it's a little more clear in terms of specificity, but that's absolutely clear in Freud's writing and in the modern look at things. What he said was, there has to be an extra element because there were several women who he knew had been molested because of admissions by the perpetrators who themselves weren't hysterical. How do you square that with his theory? There were plenty of women who hadn't been molested who were hysterical, and that didn't make any sense either. And so following Charcot, he didn't try to make his patients fit with his theories. He abandoned his theories. <coughs> at least that part of them that directly related the one to the other. All right. And this is where the mind started to get complicated. The web, impulses, biology, sex and aggression, aggressive drives, fantasies, this idea that we have in our minds that, in fact, what it makes up our minds, these fantasies, unconscious psychic fantasies, representations of our experiences, our significant others, our, par our parental objects, our own self-objects, and they're all in this interesting, shifting, and yet stable relationship to each other. That's who we are, he thought, in a very crude way. Klein filled in the details, but Freud has sort of got that this is much more complicated than his initial structural model of the id, the ego, and the superego. To summarize that, <clears throat> structural model of the mind. Freud published this in 1923 and said, okay, here's how he sees his patient's minds functioning. The ego is the center. The ego. The ego's job is twofold. Manage internal conflict between the id and the superego and manage reality. The id is the unconscious storehouse of psychic energy. It's the primitive sexual and aggressive drives. Instinctual, evolutionary, sex and aggression. The superego is the identified values taken in from the parents. When you feel, if you steal a cookie <laughs> now, you feel guilty. If you don't, you're a psychopath. 
But most of us feel guilty when we steal something. Why? Because we've taken in, identified with, the role of our parents as lawgivers. And we have introjected, taken in, identified, the internal parent wagging its finger at us. We punish ourselves when we transgress the laws of society. That's what guilt is. Internalized punishment of the self by the self. And Freud simply called that part of the self with the wagging parental finger, the superego. But then the ego's got to deal with reality too. Here's my example. I think I've used it before. I'm walking down the street, and I see a very beautiful woman walk by. Okay, what's, what kind of position am I thrown into? My id, what's my id say? Yeah, get it, get it now, er, right now. Id doesn't like to wait, okay? The superego says, how dare you even think that way? Shame on you, you guilty thing. You must not. And the ego says, all right, look, id, I'm down with this, I'm cool, we're gonna, we're gonna do our best, we're gonna try to, to meet your needs, I get it. Superego, chill. I'm on it. I'm going to be respectful. I'm going to be responsible. I'm going to do it the right way. So then you've got to deal with reality. Then you've got to approach her and talk to her in a way that's conventional in a socially acceptable way. And the ego is in charge of handling that reality. Here's the take-home lesson. Every mental illness is a function of a two-week ego. Every mental illness is simply a self incapable of managing the tremendous internal complex conflicts that are evoked every day and or unable, not strong enough, to handle the difficult anxiety-based experiences of day-to-day -day life. It's hard to walk up to someone and start talking to them, okay? If you feel insecure, if you feel unworthy, if you feel bad, not good enough, if you have issues that preclude that, the, the suggestion is that your ego isn't strong enough to manage reality adequately, that you're too drenched in anxiety, not strong enough to deal with the difficult conflicts in reality. So there's a million different kinds of mental illness. There's a book this thick, the Diagnostic Manual, with hundreds of variations. And within those variations, there are dozens of variations. As I said, I've never seen this exactly the same mental illness twice. But they're all just variations on a theme. They're all just ego or self weakness, insufficient to manage the internal conflicts or the conflicts that our daily life inevitably throws at us. Okay? All right. Okay, bottom of page seven. We gotta get, gotta move forward a little bit. Um, Freud is probably most famous for his interpretation of dreams, his discovery of the transference, and, well, the, the primacy of the unconscious would be the third thing. The fourth thing that he is, I think, justifiably famous for is his formulation of the Oedipus complex. Now, very few people today understand it, it seems. It's not, it's, it's sort of out in the culture, but let me, let me sort of give you the basics. And it's almost worth spending a little time on the, on the story of Oedipus himself. Does, okay, the, the short version, the Reader's Digest version, the lecture note version. Oedipus was a prince of Thebes. He was a baby born to Jocasta and the king of Thebes. And they took him when he was born to the oracle, because that's what you did back then, because the oracle had all the truth. And the oracle told the king and queen of Thebes that their newly born baby son was going to kill their father and marry their mother. This is a disaster. They went, oh no, we can't have that. So they gave the baby away to a farmer and told him to go put him up on the hill and let him die. All right, farmer, nice guy, couldn't do it, gives the baby to a traveling wagon that's going to this other country, uh, city-state, Corinth. Unfortunately, well, fortunately for the story, the cart is, is, has in it one of the handmaidens of the queen of Corinth, who gets back to Corinth, this other city-state, with the baby. The mother, the queen of Corinth, is childless. Her handmaiden has this baby that picked up along the road, so she graciously adopts it as her own and raises it as her son, Oedipus. Okay. At 18, Oedipus, strong, strapping young warrior of Corinth, and his two parents, who he's never been told the real story. They, he always believed that they were his parents. Nobody ever said a word. They take him to the oracle, because he's now a man, and when we want, they want to know the future, and what does the oracle say? 
you're going to kill your, mother, your father and marry your mother. And he goes, oh my God, no, this cannot be. you got to respect the oracle. So he decides, I'm leaving. And he abandons his family, abandons his, his home, and strikes out to avoid the truth of the oracle's prediction. And he gets a long ways. And what direction does he head? He heads toward Thebes, unfortunately. And on the street, on the road, he meets a, another cart. And it's got some people in it. And he is ordered off the, the, the trail. Let the cart pass. <coughs> He's the prince of Corinth. He's royalty. You don't order me off the path. And he says no. And the old guy whacks him with a stick. He flares and he kills them all. Who was it? Who's the old man? The king of Thebes, his very father. Now it gets complicated. He goes back to the city of Thebes. He goes to the city of, the city of Thebes, which has got the sphinx surrounding it and a terrible plague. And the Sphinx is not letting anybody in or out, and it's wreaking havoc among the city. And yet, there's one way to save the city, and that's to solve the riddle of the Sphinx. And the riddle of the Sphinx is, what animal walks on all fours in the morning, on two legs in the afternoon, and on three legs in the evening? And of course, the answer, which Oedipus takes up the challenge, which is gutsy, because if you lose the riddle of the Sphinx, you get eaten alive right there on the spot, okay? He's young, he's 18, he thinks he's invulnerable, so he goes for it, figures it out, and the city is saved. Well, Jocasta, the queen of Thebes, having just been tragically widowed <laughs> by some highwayman whose identity was never figured out, welcomes the young warrior into the city, thanks him for saving her city. Now that she's single, she gives him what queens have often given conquering warriors, her hand in marriage. And the oracle's prediction comes true. But of course, then that's when the plot thickens because Oedipus knows something's going on. He will not rest. He's driven to understand. And, he will, and there's a couple of folks that know. The old farmer who took him up is still alive in the service of the king and queen. And ultimately, the story comes out. And when it does, Jocasta <laughs> hangs herself. And Oedipus takes the, the brooches from her cape and plunges them into his eye, blinds himself, and, spends, and then wanders in the countryside trying to achieve some sense of inner wisdom after that, and some other adventures down the road. So Freud takes this amazing story, which 2,500 years later is still being read all over the world, as an archetype. He thought that the great literary traditions said something about human nature. Who did we have before we had psychoanalysis and psychology? Who taught us about the human mind? Wasn't it the poets? Wasn't it the great writers of great literature? We listen to Shakespeare. We read the old Greek tragedians. We read Dostoevsky. We read all the Dumas, all right? The Three Musketeers, fabulous psychological studies. Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, great psychological insight. That's where we learned about the human mind quite often until psychology came into its own after Freud. So Freud took that Oedipus myth and realized it was an archetype for a reason, that there's something real about it. That every boy, every girl must go through what he called the nuclear complex. You get this one right at ages three, four, five, and most of your development is fine, and you'll be a mostly good enough human being, decent in terms of mental illness and adequate ego strength. Get this one wrong, and mental illness will haunt you until you get it fixed. Okay? So it's slightly different for boys and girls, and I think, I've, I think I've lectured a little bit on this. I'll come back to it later, I think. But it's, it's critically important that you get that this idea remains valid, remains interesting. At age four, five, little boys start realizing that they're a lot like their dad, and dads and moms are doing stuff that they're excluded from, and they start <clears throat> sliding themselves in between mom and dad, mine. They start competing with dad. Dad becomes a competitor for mom's attention. What do little girls do? Same thing. Age four, three and a half, four, five, they become daddy's little girl. And now mom's the one they're in competition with for dad's attention. It's very complicated. It's very deep. There are incredibly complex dynamics going on in little boys and girls. But Freud's intuition about the sort of hu the human nature surrounding this Oedipal dynamic remains at least worth studying. Uh, last thing on this point is, is his idea that the unconscious is dynamic. And this is a holdover from one of his early ideas, and it remains valid, it seems to me. That the unconscious is alive. 
It's not just a repository of dead ideas and dead experiences. Where do your dreams come from? Your dreams are alive, and some of them are really weird, right? Your dreams are bizarre, and they're powerful, and they scare the hell out of you sometimes. Where do they come from? They come from the dynamic unconscious. It may be a repository of repressed experiences and emotions, but it is powerfully active, itself in great conflict, and generates tremendous influence over your day-to-day -day existence. If we can get at that with therapy, if you can get at that with your own turning in your know, own examination of your interior self and experience, then there's hope for some change. All right, he gets to the Dora case, 19, again, 1905. This is the really considered the first case of psychoanalysis. And this is a 116-page screw-up. Freud blew this case up. He failed miserably. He thought it was going to last a long time. It lasts two months. The woman came in after two months and said, I'm out of here. This is the last day. And he said, OK, let's do as much work as we can in the time remaining. And he, and he writes up this case to show how he failed to understand this thing that the case presented him that he did not understand until it was too late, until it was over, the transference. And I'm tying this together with the old stuff. The internal objects, the unconscious that's dynamic, retains power over us through the transference. We live out, we project these old patterns onto our current partners, on our current relationships, on the people in our lives. We don't treat others objectively or, or honestly. We always, especially our intimate partners, we always put on them elements of our fantasy life. And we re react to them as if they fit our patterns. I bet if you look back over your blown up relationships, you will look back and see examples of how you misunderstood. You treated someone in a way perhaps that you've been treated before, but they really weren't treating you that way. Maybe an element, maybe a little of it and you overreacted. How many of you have had an emotional response to an event and realized the next day that you overreacted? Every time that's happened, I'm gonna suggest, there was something in you that was transferred, the transference, from your childhood accumulation of fantasies and experiences into this situation that it didn't fit in exactly, but was close in some way, something was evoked in you, and maybe 10, 20% of it was accurate, but the level of your emotional response was disproportionate. And that suggests you bringing something to the table. If you can figure this out, folks, if you can see when you do this, you will blow up a lot fewer relationships. That alone is worth studying Freud for. If you can understand the transference in your daily life, if you can stop and ask yourself, wow, I'm having an emotional response. Is this a feeling or a fact? Because most of the time, if you're angry, your only feeling is, you're making me angry. You're bad. It's your fault. I'm angry. The only way you can explain that is, you're an idiot. And how does the conversation go after that? <laughs> if you start the conversation with, I'm angry, you must be an idiot, it doesn't work very well most of the time. If you can say, wow, I'm really angry. What's going on in me that might contribute to this intensity of experience? Is this person being an idiot? Completely? Or, is, or am I bringing something to the table here? Man, if you can figure that out, it'll save you a lot of pain and suffering. Okay. I'm going to save the lecture on dreams. For, we're we're going to have a whole day on dreams. And I think as a preliminary sort of introduction, Dr. Caper runs through in, in one concise chapter uh, Freud's theory of dreams very, very well. But we're going to spend a whole day on it, so I don't want to spend too much time on it now. Chapter 5, page 11 of the notes, Transference and the Crystallization of the Psychoanalytic Method. Okay, so here's the important part. We're going to have a whole day on psychotherapy, and I don't want to spend too much more time on it here. But the take-home lesson is this, that if you understand the human mind to be constructed in a particular way, then how you help someone is going to depend on that structure. If you're going to take a car apart, again, you've got to understand what the pieces and parts do in order to diagnose how it's broken and how to fix it. If you think the human mind works a certain way, then that's how you're going to do therapy. But if you're wrong, all you do is harm. Rule one by doctors, do no harm. Okay? It ought to be the same rule for therapists. But that would mean we would have to agree on the structure of the mind, and we don't. 
unfortunately. Okay? So what I'm suggesting to you is therapists are dangerous. <laughs> therapists who don't understand how the mind really works are like mechanics who don't understand how a car is put together, but they're still throwing wrenches around on the nuts and bolts in your vehicle. This is a, you would never allow a therapist who thinks a, car, uh, a mechanic, who thinks car engines are magical, to work on your car, would you? No. Why would you let someone work on your mind who thinks you can be helped with crystals? Or aligning your chakras, your energy sources from Indian mythology? Or why would you think there's a new program in one of the local universities? It's called drama therapy, where you use puppets and play acting and role play to enact scenarios that's supposed to be therapeutic. And you can get a master's degree, spend several tens of thousands of dollars in a drama therapy program, therapy program where you can then go out and be a drama therapist and help people. It's this close, I hate to say this, it's this close to criminal fraud. They take your money, tens of thousands of dollars, in student loans that you have to pay back with interest. And they give you things that do not reflect how the human mind is functioning. Now, I get there are seven perspectives in psychology. I get the theory of the mind is not, that psychoanalysis and this way of thinking does not have, does not have a lock on the truth of all of the mind. The, the cognitive behaviorists have a huge chunk of explanatory power. And I respect that. So do the evolutionary psychologists and the others. But I'm telling you now that you cannot rely on experts in this field. You must rely on yourselves. You must rely, you are responsible. If you turn yourself, your husband and wife team, your couple, your, your lesbian homosexual couples, your children over to therapists, God help you if you haven't done your homework. You don't know who you're turning them over to. I, I, it's, you have to be careful. You have to take responsibility. Just because they have a lot of fancy letters after their name, doesn't mean they know what they're doing. One of my goals in this course is to teach you enough about the basics so at least you can ask intelligent questions of therapists if you ever go to seek help. Because you need to. More of that on the day we get to therapy. Okay. All right, I gotta talk for a few minutes about the case of Little Hans, chapter seven, a specimen case. We're moving now beyond Dora. We're moving now about childhood sexuality, and I'm on page 15 of the notes. I've got to talk for a few minutes about what Freud discovered in the little Hans case. It only goes to 14. Okay, I'll give you some more later of the lecture notes. Take, a, take, a, take notes as best you can. Um, okay, you were supposed to read this material, so I'm, I'm hoping at least some of it made sense to you. Here's the nuts and bolts of the little Hans case. A, it taught Freud how powerfully children are affected by A, fantasies, and B, how powerfully sexual or erotic those fantasies were. That little children have thoughts about where babies come from, about how daddy gives mommy babies, about what they get to do and what they don't get to do and why. And it's, and, and, the little Hans case I think is particularly useful, for discussing how scary that is. How scary that is for children. You know what, this shouldn't be a big shock because folks, how scary is dating for you as an adult? All right, you feel real comfortable on a first date? That's like a nightmare most of the time. First date, come on. Anxiety, it's drenched in, in sexual <coughs> dynamics. Does he like me, does she like me? Where is this going, how long is it gonna last? Is it gonna be great? I'm scared, you know, performance anxiety in every capacity. And what little Hans instructed Freud is this is an old conflict. That sexuality, that relational dynamics are fraught with anxiety. And even children who we used to think had this ideal little life are in great conflict between the roles they play with and between their parents. And they're worried about their father and, and what Freud called castration anxiety. If you're trying to compete with your father to win your mother in the Oedipal complex, you must realize at some point that your dad is big and you are small. And if you compete too aggressively, you're in danger. OK? 
okay? And so how young boys work through that is important, but it's inevitable that it's there. How young girls work through the identification with the mother, and yet the competition with her for the father's attention. Ladies, isn't it true that, it's some, that competition between women is vicious sometimes? Truth be told, quietly, when the guys aren't around, you admit it to each other? Where, does, where do you learn that, ladies? You learn it at your mother's footstep in competition with her for your father's attention. It's that intense, it's that primitive, and as adults, as adolescents, as teenagers, it's that dangerous. Okay. Sort of to summarize a little bit, Freud's idea of fantasy in this context began to, he began to see even more complexity. Do the children repress their aggressive propensities? Or are there sexual dynamics, libidinal dynamics, transformed into something else? He wasn't sure, it was complicated. Where does aggression go? Where does sexuality go in childhood development? Those questions, I think, are still being asked and, and answered at least tentatively even to this day. The last thing that Freud, I think, came out of the Hans, little Hans case with is this idea of identification. And this you've got to get. Identification becomes a central issue in the structure of the human mind. How does one's ego become strong enough to manage the internal conflicts, to deal with reality? And Freud said, identification that we take in experiences, loving experiences, nurturing experiences, strong, healthy, maternal and paternal experiences of care and love and devotion. And in that matrix of paternal and maternal care, we identify with our strong and capable parents who give us an example to learn from. But more importantly, we at a very unconscious level take in their dynamics. It becomes our superego. It becomes our sense of identity, much more than just the superego. That's the vehicle by which the human mind is developed, according to Freud at this early stage. That we, in experiences with our parents, don't just learn from them cognitively. We literally take in the fantasy of them inside of us. And that becomes, in a direct and powerful way, the very nature of our sense of selves in the world. Those experiences lay the foundation. And the last point is that it's not a linear development. I think the way Freud initially thought. He thought that you went through the oral and anal and phallic, etc. And then if you were an adult and had mental illness, it was because you regressed all the way back. We don't think that way anymore. In Melanie Klein's way of thinking, we bring it all with us. That we accumulate experience. And the, the way I like to phrase it is, I don't really have to go very far to go crazy, because I pretty much brought crazy with me. I'm just, I just got to go over here. That we all have the ability to become psychotic. We all have the ability to, re to revert to more primitive ways of functioning. And the truth is, we do it all the time, in little ways. When you lose your temper, when you overreact, you're regressing to a primitive way of functioning. When you split, when you see somebody who's complex, and you just think they're evil then you're regressing to an old way of experiencing the world involving splitting and projection we'll talk about later. So identification becomes the vehicle for Freud's development of the structure of the inner world, which Klein then takes and runs with. Freud thought of it as the earliest expression of an emotional tie to another person. Folks, here's the tie-in. This is so far beyond the mechanical model. OK, everybody get that? But this way of thinking about identification, the Oedipus complex, human relationships taken in and building the structure of self and identity is just not anything at all like this mechanical dynamic uh, model of an engine of the mind. All right. It really becomes a psychology based on relationships, on emotional meaning on the way we handle anxiety and aggression and sexuality, but in the context of the sense of myself as, as a strong individual in the context of this internal object relational dynamic. Most all of it unconscious and all of it profoundly powerful. 
right, we'll take a break now and drive on with this material in the next couple of lectures.